Hello, I'm Valerie Smith, president of Swarthmore College, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our fifth annual Engaged Scholarship Symposium hosted by the Eugene M. Lang Center for Civic and Social Responsibility. Ernest Boyer coined the term engaged scholarship to describe teaching and research that connect, quote, the rich resources of the university to our most pressing social, civic, and ethical problems. With the problems that our world faces today, higher education needs engaged scholarship now more than ever. Over the next three days, we are proud to host presentations by representatives from some of the nation's recognized leaders in engaged scholarship, Brown University, Duke University, Miami-Dade College, Portland State University, Tulane University, the University of San Diego, as well as Swarthmore College. We will all be sharing curricular innovations and thoughtful responses to the past year's pandemic that may prove useful to a broader audience. We hope that these presentations will be the start of ongoing conversations and collaborations. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for that gracious introduction, President Smith. It's really meaningful to have you convening us for this great three-day symposium. I'm Ben Berger, Associate Professor of Political Science at Swarthmore College and Executive Director of the Eugene M. Lang Center for Civic and Social Responsibility. To all of you joining us live, we have over 250 participants. We're watching a recorded version afterward. I'm thrilled to be part of such a talented lineup. It's my privilege to introduce our session one moderator, Assistant Professor of Psychology, Barbara Thelamore at Swarthmore College. Professor Thelamore is an engaged scholarship practitioner working with, among other community partners, the Chester Charter Scholars Academy in Chester, Pennsylvania. And recently, Project Pericles selected her as an Arthur Vining Davis Foundation Pericle Periclean faculty leader in STEM and social sciences. Professor Thelamore, please take it away. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, it is my pleasure to be moderating this panel where our scholars will, be, will share their insights and experiences on campus community engagement and collaboration in the midst of this global pandemic. As with so many areas of our personal and professional lives, the pandemic has created challenges to the work of engaged scholarship, but also opportunities to adapt. I'm excited to learn from our panelists representing four institutions across the country and how they've navigated this time. First, a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, audience members, you are welcome to submit your questions to our panelists through the Q&A function. If you wish to submit your question anonymously, please indicate that. Uh, each panelist will present for 15 minutes, followed by five minutes for questions, and then we will go to the next presenter. Uh, for those panelists who are not speaking, I ask you to please mute your mic to eliminate any uh, distractions. So without further ado, I will turn it to our first presenter, Jason Green from Portland State University. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to present today. My name is Jason Green, and I use he, him pronouns. I'm one of the co-founders and the assistant director of Portland State University's Homelessness Research and Action Collaborative. I want to start with a brief uh, land acknowledgement. Portland State University is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County. Today, I'd like to honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin and Kalapoya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. The history of our community affects every aspect of our work today, especially the disproportionate rates of housing insecurity and homelessness faced by communities of color as an ongoing legacy of genocide, slavery, displacement, and historical and contemporary racism in systems and policies. I'm going to be talking about homelessness and housing uh, insecurity in the context of engaged scholarship um, for the rest of my presentation, but I wanted to make certain to make clear how important the land acknowledgement is in the history of the places in which we work. To provide a little bit of context at the start, I wanted to offer this statistic on homelessness. 
An estimated 570,000 people across the US experienced homelessness on a single night in 2019. This is the most recent figure for literal homelessness, people living on the street or in an emergency shelter, but it's almost certainly an undercount. Roughly 17% of all college and university students across the US experience homelessness. This is an issue that affects not just our communities, but our students and our fellow employees and faculty as well. This is from a Hope Center report that included responses from more than 300,000 students at 400 colleges and universities. Among the respondents, nearly 40% of students experienced food insecurity in the previous month, and about 46% experienced housing insecurity in the previous year. PSU, like many public universities, has very similar numbers to the national figures. The Homelessness Research and Action Collaborative was formed in 2018 to help reduce homelessness and its negative impacts with an emphasis on communities of color through research and evidence-based best practices. HRAC brings together expertise and skills from across PSU's 10 colleges and partners with a wide range of stakeholders, including people with lived experience of homelessness. I'm going to talk a little bit about our um, key projects that we completed in the past few years and then move on to some uh, examples of engaged scholarship in our work. HRAC conducted one of the first university basic needs surveys on food insecurity, housing insecurity, and homelessness of both students and employees um, at any university in the nation. We issued that report last year and it's available online. We often work with people experiencing homelessness as co-researchers, and we did this in a recent project to help design Portland Street Response, which is a non-police response to assist people experiencing homelessness or mental health crisis. We also designed, built, and are currently evaluating tiny home villages as transitional housing for people who have been experiencing homelessness. Each of these projects had multiple student researchers who participated, and we make certain that we have a budget for graduate research assistance on nearly all projects we do, whether it's writing them into our grant proposals or spending center funds to make certain that they can participate in the research. We had to do a lot of modifications to our research and our projects in response to the COVID pandemic. Some of the things we did included indefinite postponement for a few projects that we felt we could not do safely in any way and couldn't move online. For those projects where we could shift the virtual engagement, we did that. And there were a very few projects where we found a way to do some safe in-person engagement in the summer and fall um, with extensive safety protocols. Because people experiencing homelessness are a high risk population due to the chronic stress of living without shelter, in addition to any disabling conditions they may already have, we had to be especially careful not to put any of our project partners and participants at risk. This was an invention from one of our designers that helped us facilitate some safe in-person research. So this is called the engagement station. Martha Bettany designed it for us. It gives us a way to have safe socially distanced interactions outside. It's portable, so it actually folds up into a briefcase and umbrella that you can take with you. Um, it meets COVID safety requirements. So you have six feet of spacing. You have a clear barrier between the researcher and the participant. You have an umbrella for sun, if you're lucky enough to live somewhere with sun, or rain, if you live in Portland. Um, and we made all the plans available for free to anyone who's interested in building their own. So you can go to our website, pdx.edu slash homelessness, and you can read about our research projects, and you can also download the plans for this engagement station if it's something that you wanted to explore yourself. So we made a number of changes to our existing research projects. Um, we made a lot of shifts. We made a lot of sacrifices, unfortunately. Uh, but we also wanted to make certain that we were responding to the needs of the moment. So we did launch some responsive research on a really short time frame to try and meet some pressing needs and address some emerging questions that we saw as a result of the pandemic. Two key projects that we launched in response to the pandemic were a set of surveys of housing needs and preferences for people experiencing unsheltered homelessness and an estimated cost of evictions in Oregon when our evictions moratorium expires.
So at the start of the pandemic, there were numerous discussions around emergency shelter options. Um, FEMA has provided some funding to either rent or purchase hotel and motel rooms. And a lot of state governments have also purchased or leased hotels and motels to enable non-congregate shelters. So to give people more space, to provide isolation spaces, um, and basically to provide a place for people who are at extremely high risk of COVID complications and are living unsheltered to be safe. We did a very early survey at the beginning of the pandemic of shelter options because there was a lot of discussion among providers and government of what would be best. Um, putting aside housing, which is always going to be the best solution, more than half of our respondents preferred a hotel or motel. There was a lot of discussion around expanding tent camps or making sanctioned tent camps. Uh, Portland actually created a few of these, you know, building out new sort of traditional congregate mass shelters. Um, and this was really something that did not meet the needs of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. And we were able to, to work with this population to conduct the survey and demonstrate that. Um, we were able to do this because we worked very closely with some nonprofits and advocacy organizations that were routinely engaging with people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, even during the pandemic. So as part of their sort of daily activities and services, we trained co-researchers virtually who could then deliver these surveys and interviews in person to the people they were already serving. So they are observing safety protocols, but we weren't introducing any new people into these interactions. Um, we worked with some people who were experiencing or had recently experienced homelessness as co-researchers as well. Uh, we had some amazing partners in this project. Uh, one is a newspaper called Street Roots, and they helped train and deploy some surveyors among their, um, their staff, who are often people experiencing homelessness, who are selling newspapers or doing reporting and writing on the newspaper that they put together. <clears throat> Excuse me. As the pandemic moved on, we started to look more about what people needed in terms of more permanent housing. Um, Portland has recently passed an affordable housing bond and a supportive housing services bond to provide both more affordable housing and more services for people who need those to retain their housing and stay in housing. What we really wanted to do is drill down to the specific needs of communities of color experiencing unsheltered homelessness, because this is a group that is dramatically overrepresented among people experiencing homelessness. Black and indigenous Americans experience homelessness at disproportionate rates compared to white Americans. And there's a very clear link to systemic and historical racism in why they experience homelessness at that rate. What we wanna do is make certain that this new supportive housing services measure was providing services that, that really met the needs of the community and in particular communities of color to feel safe and supported and successful when they moved into housing. So in this survey, we had some really interesting findings. One is that many, many people experiencing unsheltered homelessness really wanted access to therapists, healthcare, and case workers. They needed access to effective services and they could envision what those services would look like for them and how they would help them if they were made available. In terms of what would make them feel safe and supported in housing, what they wanted was their own bathroom, not a shared bathroom, their own kitchen or somewhere they could cook, not a shared kitchen, access to employment opportunities, and the ability for friends and family to visit. There are a lot of um, discussions around creating very cheap sort of hostel style housing for people experiencing homelessness where there are shared bathrooms, shared kitchen, and a lot of restrictions on visitation. What we heard again and again and again from people is that having someplace they could cook for themselves was important. Having a bathroom where they had privacy was important. And they really wanted to be able to maintain their current connections with friends and family and establish new connections. Those relationships were essential for them to feel safe and supported and to succeed in retaining housing. And these are basic human needs. They're no different for any of us but many of these barriers are often placed in front of people experiencing homelessness before they can access even fundamental services. So I think this survey is really showing that we need to make certain we're meeting people's emotional needs when they're accessing housing for them to be successful. Some of their biggest concerns across the board were losing housing for some reason, 
Um, a lot of time people go into a shelter or a program, you know, sometimes the shelter closes, the program ends, they end up back on the street. There's a huge fear, that uncertainty around rotating their housing. Um, experiencing discrimination based on an identity or experiencing racism were huge fears as well. Um, one question uh, was especially powerful for me. When asked what would make them feel most supported in community and housing, uh, Native American respondents listed less discrimination as highly as food security and access to food. Not facing discrimination, not facing racism is as fundamental um, as being able to eat, as having enough food. And so I think that's something we really need to think about in terms of how we design systems of care and support and housing and services that are engaging with vulnerable populations. One other very recent project we did was using a calculator that was developed by the University of Arizona to estimate the societal cost of evictions. So we worked with a number of Oregon service providers and government agencies to gather data for Oregon itself. And we issued a report in February. We saw that about 89,000 households in Oregon owed back rent at that time. There was $378 million in back rent owed. Um, but if the eviction moratorium in Oregon was allowed to expire, based on the estimated range of households facing eviction that go on to experience homelessness, which is between 25 and 62% based on the studies we looked at, it would cost Oregon 1.1 to 3.3 billion dollars if they faced eviction. So we were able to share this with policymakers and with the news media to show that the cost of supporting people in retaining their housing by helping them pay off their back rent if they had lost their job or had no other a way to pay it off was not only a more effective way to prevent homelessness than just letting them become evicted, but was actually a dramatically cheaper option for the state of Oregon than allowing them to get evicted. This estimate um, didn't even cover loss of income, increase in public assistance, gaps in education, or the long-term impact on individual health. It really just looked at shelters, healthcare, child welfare, and juvenile justice. So these are probably an underestimate. So in summary, our approach is to work extensively with student and community researchers on projects as co-researchers, including people who are currently experiencing homelessness as researchers alongside us. We partner with government agencies and grassroots advocates to answer essential questions about their work. And we try to be forward looking and not only addressing what we're facing now, but thinking about what the impacts of different policies might be in the long term. When we do a research study, we prepare reports for media and elected officials to highlight key findings to spur action and enable them to understand and act on what we are revealing from our research. That's a very brief overview of the engaged scholarship and engaged research work we do at the Homelessness Research and Action Collaborative at Portland State University. I'd love to hear your questions and I'd love to remain in contact. You can go to our website, pdx.edu slash homelessness to read about any of these research reports and see some of the other research we've been doing. Thank you, Jason. So again, to the audience, if you have any questions for Jason, please include them in the Q&A function. Um, I actually have a question for you. Um, as you've been sharing these statistics with policymakers and other stakeholders, what has been the reaction, particularly when you present that number that it's almost almost 10 times um, the cost to keep people and attempt to house folks than it is to evict them? I think we see a lot of surprise. Um... You know, people don't understand how expensive it is to deal with the health and justice system costs of unsheltered homelessness versus the cost of just putting people in housing and providing the services they need. Many, many studies have been done on permanent supportive housing that show that permanent supportive housing typically costs the same or less than the cost that we incur every single day by not addressing homelessness. The challenge is that it's a wrong pocket problem. So the parts of the government and society that save these costs are not always the ones that are going to be spending the money to build the permanent supportive housing or are going to be providing rent relief or subsidies. So that's a major challenge for policymakers is to figure out when looking at the total cost of society, how are we making certain that we're, you know, paying these in a way that is equitable and if we're shifting costs, how do we do that. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, our an audience member, Morgan. Thank you for this presentation. Can you share a little, um, little bit about the history and founding of the HRAC and how the center came into being? Absolutely, thank you for that question. So a few years ago, uh, PSU's president announced uh, essentially uh, a call for proposals to launch two new research centers, interdisciplinary research centers at PSU, focused on engaged scholarship, focused on research and scholarship that would have some sort of community impact and that would deeply engage both the PSU community and the Portland community. Um, I worked with a team that put together one of about two dozen proposals for our centers. Um, and we ended up getting picked along with one other proposal for some seed funding to launch the research center. That was in uh, 2018, so we've, we've only been around for just under three years now, and it's been a pretty exciting ride so far. Other questions from the audience? If not, thank you so much, Jason. Um, we are going to go to our next set of presenters um, now from Swarthmore College, uh, Ashley Henry. Oh, I think we have one more question. Sorry about that. Um, for Jason, one more. Um, can you talk about how you engage with community partners and nonprofits working with people experiencing homelessness on this work? Absolutely. So we spend a lot of time, not physically now, unfortunately, um, but engaging with community partners, going to visit them, talking to them, working with advocacy organizations, um, not just sort of inviting them into our space, but making certain that we are reaching out to them, working with them in community, spending time with them in community to understand what they're doing, um, where the gaps might be in their, in their knowledge or understanding of issues, and also really learning from them as much as we can. You know, a lot of advocacy organizations, community organizations, and especially communities of color are doing their own research. They're doing fantastic research, but it's not always recognized by the academy as valid, which is, um, is upsetting. Uh, but I think one really important promise of engaged scholarship is working with these groups that are doing incredible work, at learning from them and working with them in partnership to make certain that the research they're doing is getting heard. Not doing that in an exploitative way, but doing it in a way where we, we recognize and honor their work and hopefully we can contribute to that in some way and making certain that when we're going to policymakers or we're going to the media that we're making certain to show that they are the originators of much of this research and what we're doing is hopefully supplementing that and, and you know, building with them towards a more complete understanding of these pictures. Um. Do you compensate community-based um, partners in doing this research and where do you draw funds for that? Thank you, Edwin, for the question. That's a great question, absolutely, yeah. I mean, they should be paid and compensated as co-researchers. So we build that into grant funding, but we don't have it in grant funding, we pay that out of our own pocket. So we make certain that if somebody's administering a survey for us, helping us design a survey, doing trainings, anytime a community partner works with us, we try to, we make certain that we're paying them. Um, and we often provide stipends for participants in recognition of their time, just you know, sort of sharing their experience with us and sharing their insights with us as well. So yeah, we try to, to compensate everybody that we work with in community. And I think we've done a, a pretty good job of that so far, even when we can't build in the grant funding just by paying out of pocket. Thank you again, Jason. So now let's move to um, Ashley Henry and Mark Wallace from Swarthmore College. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Ashley Henry and I'm program manager at the Lang Center for Civic and Social Responsibility at Swarthmore College. The mission of the Lang Center at Swarthmore College is to connect the college's curricular excellence to engagement with communities. And in my role, I work along with college faculty and staff to oversee institutional partnerships with the local community of Chester, Pennsylvania. So for this presentation, my colleague and co-presenter, Dr. Mark Wallace, will be discussing two of Swarthmore's best models of engaged scholarship, the Chester Semester Fellowship and the Chester Community Summer Fellowship, programs that truly center community perspectives and participation in how we carry out our engaged scholarship work. We'll also share specific ways that we have been able to keep the community at the heart of the work that we're doing despite challenges to in-person engagement resulting from the continuing pandemic. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Wallace, who'll begin by providing some background and context for our work with the City of Chester. 
Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here today. Uh, a personal note, I uh, typically am in the Philadelphia area, but today I'm my daughter is about to give birth. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm a little bit rattled. I have an unstable internet connection, so I can hear the gist of what's going on, but some of it is a little bit garbled. I hope you can hear me better than I can hear you. Um, introduce me. Uh, I'm a professor of religion and environmental studies at Swarthmore College. And about four years ago, I had a dream of collaborating with some of the people on this call here, in particular, Ben Burke, to develop a program in the city of Chester in friendship with Swarthmore College that would offer students opportunities for engaged scholarship that would be credit bearing the needs of community stakeholders and less on the traditional four walls of the classroom that marks higher education in the United States. To that end, I approached Swarthmore College about the possibility based program called Chester Semester that would, as it's now evolved, have only one hour of uh, class meeting time and then a much larger commitment, anywhere from five to seven hours per week. Stakeholders in high value internships. A quick note about Swarthmore, where Swarthmore College is located and the city of Chester, about four miles to the south of Swarthmore. The two communities, but very, very different de demographically. Swarthmore College is a majority white, largely well-resourced college town. Chester City is a majority black. Uh, that has been part of the economic engine, that's been part of the economic engine that has driven the area in and around Philadelphia, but an area that has been the object of disinvestment and racism, uh, including uh, environmental racism of a higher order that I hope to allude to in, in a moment. In the context of knowing about the history between Swarthmore and Chester, the focus on the machine politics that governed the area just outside of Philadelphia in a collar suburb called Delaware County where Swarthmore College and Chester City are located. And those machine politics have dominated the area of the Civil War. In the context of those machine politics, the city of Chester became marked by a series of dysfunctions planned and organized by white overseers of the in and around Delaware that are uh, notable on the one hand for setting up uh, what seems at times to be an impossible to change school to prison pipeline on the one hand and the city of Chester City called uh, a toxic killing field because Chester now hosts the country's largest uh, trash incinerator. So in an urban community of 30,000 plus people, uh, families, children, and part, uh, a large incinerator sits in the middle of the city, degrading the health and the well-being of the people who are residents of the city of Chester. My dream in partnership with folks here like this, was largely to build bridges of friendship between the College of Swarthmore and, and Chester City around issues that could be addressed in ways that could possibly ameliorate and that had seemed to be unable to be addressed over decades and decades of dysfunction. And to do so in this spirit of friendship and partnership 
in a way that would cultivate understanding of their own needs and what solutions they might think Swarthmore College and students committed to those solutions might bring to the conversation. Not that the university, but that leaders and others in the city of Chester might enter into a partnership with Swarthmore College in which knowledge about addressing these intractable problems, problems like food and school to prison pipeline that I mentioned and the environmental squalor that I, I noted, that these seemingly intractable problems, solutions could be co-generated between the college on the one hand and the wider community on the other. On my own some years ago in the city of Chester, I thought a lead paint abatement program would be the right kind of strategy to start with in the spirit of building trust and friendship. And immediately folks that I met that idea of talking instead about education and the need for young people to have access to a well-rounded education so that they could be successful uh, in life. And um, it, that was an, an initial kind of bringing an agenda versus listening to community stakeholders about what their needs and their vision might be. I want to stop, uh, I want to close out rather what I'm saying um, by talking about Chester semester is to break down the walls of the classroom so that students fully enter into the wider community and do so in a spirit of friendship and offer them and hopefully mutual transformation. Community members, families, kids, teachers, clergy, on the one hand, and Swarthmore faculty and staff and students on the other, entering into this and providing then a kind of seamless network of support between the college and the community that would focus on two programs the Chester semester program, which is highlighted during the action, and the Chester Community Fellowship Program that I think um, Ashley Henry will talk about, which is focused on as uh, a premier program during the summer months when the college largely is not in session. I'm happy along with Ashley to entertain questions when the time uh, is right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, and thanks for being with us despite uh, the circumstances that you're in. <laughs> okay, so next I'm going to be talking about uh, our next model of engaged scholarship that really maps onto student engagement with Chester during the academic year, which is the Chester Community Fellowship Program, which provides really a seamless continuity of engagement for students to collaborate with Chester residents and organizations during the summer months. And so the Chester Community Fellowship, or we'll refer to it as CCF for short, was created through a generous gift made to the Swarthmore Foundation by the late Eugene Lang, Swarthmore alum, class of 1938. Today, CCF is a signature Lang Center program that annually provides grants to highly motivated Swarthmore students to support a 10-week summer internship with a Chester-based community organization. And so as you see here, our Chester partners are associated with community work being done in a variety of major academic fields, such as public health, education, housing, and so on. And so since the program started in 2007, CCF has provided Swarthmore students with meaningful opportunities to integrate social action into their academic pursuits by means of projects and research that help to develop them as engaged citizens. This is just some pre-pandemic -pre slides of them doing their good work. Um, these are some volunteer and recreational activities that they're doing with community residents. 
And so not only are they really doing project and research work that helps them in their own student learning, but as shared in these quotes, these programs and the work that students are doing really help to enhance the capacities of Chester organizations in a tremendous way. So what are some of the key lessons learned? Well, I think that um, Mark and I both agree that engaged scholarship work at Swarthmore has always placed value on incorporating the perspectives of community partners. In fact, we used to conduct an orientation program called Chester 101, which was a five to six hour orientation for students doing community-based work in Chester that included a panel of Chester representatives and a bus tour of the city. And Swarthmore faculty in the Department of Education would supplement uh, this orientation by doing some additional training specific to a student's work in Chester. What we realized, however, was that this approach to orienting students to their engaged scholarship work was really only an introduction to the city, coordinated by the college with little if any connection to a student's coursework. And what was truly needed was an integrative and progressive approach to training that was community led and that better reflected a connection to a student's scholarship. And so in recent years, our goal has been to place a higher value on the people of the partnership by letting our engagement with the city of Chester be community led. So Chester leaders and residents are conducting the training. They're providing entry to Chester spaces on foot instead of by bus. They are now invited into classroom discussions weekly as co-educators with Swarthmore's faculty and are working with the Lang Center in an advisory capacity to steer the direction of the college's work with Chester. So we've learned a humility in working with Chester residents, seeing them as the experts of their own experience instead of the college community, which demonstrates a shift away from learning about a community of people to learning with a community. So in 2018, Chester Fellows had the privilege of working with Edgar Kahn, Swarthmore alum, social justice advocate and originator of the concept of time banking. And he introduced the theoretical framework of co-production, which encourages the co-creation of knowledge and outcomes with others instead of for others. And that has really been the central emphasis of the Lang Center's engaged scholarship work over the last several years. And what has really enabled students to view Chester in particular from an assets-based perspective, so through the lens of the resources that the community does have to create solutions on the ground, rather than through the lens of its deficits. And so in March, 2020, uh, life around the world changed for everyone with the emergence of COVID-19 and in-person engagement at Swarthmore and many other campuses became entirely virtual. And so this meant that programs that prided themselves on placing students in communities to work directly with residents and organizations had to completely adjust. And so, you know, at that point in time, the format of the work clearly changed from in-person to remote, but the strength and integrity of our relationships with our community partners has not changed. In fact, the pandemic actually gave us an opportunity to reinforce our commitment to meeting community needs during such a challenging time. And so as we sought to adapt our programming, we asked ourselves, how can we still prioritize the needs of Chester partners while ensuring that students are still meeting the learning goals of our programs despite having remote experiences? And so enter Zoom University as we're all now well acquainted with. So our first opportunity to attempt real engagement with Chester over Zoom was last summer with the 2020 CCF cohort. Not only were we able to place our eight fellows in full-time remote internships with five Chester-based organizations, but we also created alternative remote engaged options for community partners to join fellows in weekly cohort discussions. So for example, on Mondays, every week for 10 weeks, fellows met virtually as a group to discuss core themes concerning Chester's storied history and present day economic redevelopment with a focus on the revitalization of a certain neighborhood of the city called the Overtown area. These weekly sessions were facilitated by Swarthmore Associate Professor Edwin Mayorga and Chester community resident Christopher Rogers. And they were further enriched by participation from Chester residents and entrepreneurs who very candidly shared with fellows their perspectives on Chester's past, present, and future. And so with this ability to connect with Chester fellows virtually, 
we were able to triple the number of engagement spells traditionally would have with members of the Chester community. And the partners reported feeling more engaged with Swarthmore students and the college as a whole than ever before. And so this slide here highlights the many individuals that students were able to connect with virtually. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, a secondary goal of CCF is to provide fellows with opportunities to see and act from an assets-based perspective uh, with people and in institutions of Chester. So to that end, 2020 fellows participated in a story gathering and storytelling project that encouraged them to collect assets-based stories about Chester through interviews and virtual field research. And so uh, their efforts resulted in a number of media pieces that are actually available for your viewing uh, at the Lang Center's YouTube channel that's here, but they were able to produce a podcast, a public service announcement, and a curated interview uh, with the Chester Children's Chorus. And so we're doing our part to more broadly raise awareness of Chester's community assets by publicizing this content to others. But we welcome you to view that on your own as well. Okay, so how did we replicate this type of work? Well, throughout the 2021 academic year, we were able to replicate the summer success of virtual engagement in Dr. Wallace's Chester Semester Fellowship course, which now includes almost weekly participation from Chester partners who lead class discussions based on their lived experiences and professional expertise. An engagement of this kind is currently happening now in courses offered by the Department of Religion, the Environmental Studies Program, the Black Studies Program, and more. And not only with communities in Chester, um, right now we're also working with formerly incarcerated individuals uh, in the, that were formerly incarcerated in the New Jersey prison system. They're recently returning to life outside of prison and they have a lot to share with students about mass incarceration. Uh, we actually invite you to hear that presentation at uh, session two tomorrow. But these opportunities for student learning were not accessible or as accessible uh, when we were fully in person. So it's kind of a, we turned an opportunity into an obstacle into an opportunity. And so now the word has gotten out so much so that our student enrollment for Chester semester for CCF this summer, it has doubled, which is a testament to the fact that there's a real thirst for these types of engaged scholarship experiences among students, not just at small liberal arts institutions like Swarthmore, but even more broadly. And so during this time of physical distancing, students are really yearning to have academic experiences that allow them to develop a deep connection to others. And so we hope that uh, what Dr. Wallace and I have shared today with you has given you some insight into how universities or colleges and community partnerships can really uh, be mutually enriching and impactful, even in a virtual form as well as how a strong foundation for community-centered engagement scholarship work can be built at any institution. And so we're going to, this is just a, a final slide of what things were like pre-pandemic. We do hope that this is our last in-person program engagement. We can be established this next summer, but we'd like you to uh, hear directly from Swarthmore students who were Chester fellows during the pandemic, as well as from our Chester partners about their experiences with these two programs that we've highlighted. And they'll be happy to take some of your questions. So please watch. My name is Nadir Matur. I'm currently a sophomore from Palestine. I am uh, Chris Gaeta. I'm a junior at Sophomore College and a Chester Community Fellow. Hello, I'm Caden Fullerton, also a sophomore student. I'm from Delaware, and I'm also a Chester Community Fellow. My name is Tammy Pham. I'm a first year, so a freshman at Swarthmore College. I was a Chester Community Fellow in the summer of 2020, and I worked with the Chester Housing Authority. And I participated in the Chester Semester Program Association with the Link Center. Swarthmore College is really dedicated to intensive learning. 
these scholars we've been working with, they help us to do a better job of privately engaged scholarship and publicly engaged scholarship. They're brilliant people. They're accomplished scholars. So they help us just to do a better job of analyzing texts and talking about the meaning of texts and coming to an understanding of the world around us. And they also help us to do engaged scholarship because insofar as we also look at topics and subjects that are outside of the college walls. I heard like the, the phrase engaged scholarship for the very first time through the Lang Center actually. The scholarship part is obviously like you, you know, becoming knowledgeable in whatever field or whatever subject area it is that you're trying to pursue. But then the engaged part is like you taking that knowledge and actually doing something with it. You take what you learn, whatever it is, you take it and you apply it in some way that benefits the community and gives back to it. I'll give you this example. If you'll make a fist, just make a fist, all right, and try to look through that fist. Try to look through it. Now, just open it up just a little bit, just a little bit, so you just see a little bit of air. And that's what I show them, that when you first come into my classroom, that tight fist is your perspective of education. And I can guarantee by the time we're finished with one another, and I tell them, not by the time you finish with me, by the time you're finished, you know, we're finished with one another, you'll have a whole different perspective. In engaged scholarship, you have to contribute. You're not, you're not working by yourself. There is a community you're providing to. You have to understand that community. You're constantly working with teams because it's really hard to influence a community all by your own. You have, you have to develop a certain level of understanding. We know that the college community is proud and delighted knowing that they are part of the CCC success. Not only did it grow up on campus, but the campus nurtured us in a way. The students that I've had at Swarthmore College have been so good that they're able to develop policy for me, which I then share, and I'm not joking, with people at the state level that need to be educated about these issues. That's how good your students are. And I think we've only begun to understand how college students can possibly affect public policy. This approach to participatory politics, ways of incentivizing and creating platforms for you, yes, but also wider commentary and critique, and criticism and discussion and uh, imagining solutions, that participatory culture that can be driven through a city. I know that cities who complain more run better and more and more efficient. But the problem of the city of Chester is in order to get that started, you have to allow the dam to break. I need a lot of help with organizing and structuring, you know, a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. You know, every day is a new idea, it's a new task for me, you know. And I know some of those brains that smart were, you need that type of energy to try to that kind of help us push things over that hump. I think we've come to a, a great point all all together, but I think it's about elevating us to the next stages. And I know that in order to get us where we need to be downtown, we need that organization for peace. So whatever you are doing, whatever you are doing, whatever measure you're taking, there is always something to do in 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 the community in Chester or or elsewhere. There, the world needs so much. I would definitely recommend engage scholarship courses to any and all students that I come across. If you learn about people, you'll discover yourself more. Um, you'll be a better communicator, a better entrepreneur, a better thinker, a better, better at developing new skills. So go for it, definitely. Thank you so much, um, Mark and Ashley. So we have time for one question. Um, and I'll, I've, what was posted, do you, do you do any kind of training with your students prior to entering the community in terms of um, poverty simulations, cultural sensitivity, the history of the community, anything towards that end? Yes, I'll speak to that. I'm not sure if, if Mark's able to. Um, in the past, we've actually uh, tried to do training that actually takes place in Chester um, by people who live in Chester or really uh, focused on doing at the forefront of the work in Chester. So some of the topics were actually in the slide, but cultural safety and humility 
right? Positionality, privilege, power, having students really reflect, reflect on where they're coming from before they go into a community that perhaps they haven't worked in before um, so that they can think about what their approaches are like so that they're not doing harm, but they're actually doing good. And really that perspective taking that Ms. T in the video talked about, really making sure that they're open to different perspectives and perhaps what they're used to um, is how we try to prepare them. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have Malia Fanin from Tulane University who will be presenting on uh, their work there. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm Malia Fanin and I'm coming to you from the Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking at Tulane University in New Orleans. And I'm joined by Angela Kyle, the co-founder and executive director of PlayBuild. And our, unfortunately, our graduate assistant on this project, Megan, was unable to make it today due to a family emergency. Um, but her thoughts are in this presentation. And so we're gonna be sharing our experiences of how we as project collaborators in this a long-term university community partnership have responded to the pandemic We'll show how we were shifting to new models of community engagement uh, pre-pandemic and how we've continued to push that shift. And I think our presentation is gonna offer a somewhat unique perspective on this panel, as we're not really saying that we've successfully adapted in response to the pandemic so that we could do what we had been doing before or what we had intended to do, um, but more that it offered us an opportunity to question business as usual and to rethink our goals thus the title pausing, right? Um, our presentation has nothing to do with the house float you see to the right, but this was just a great sort of asynchronous community engagement innovation by the city of New Orleans and really by the crews um, where we couldn't celebrate Mardi Gras. So I just wanted to, to celebrate that spirit. So this is first part, we're just going to talk about some of these models of partnership and that progression that I mentioned as we kind of move from a client service model towards co-inquiry in the pandemic. I want to introduce you to the Taylor Center. So this is an interdisciplinary co-curricular unit um, whose mission is to cultivate a diverse network of change makers who are working and learning together to create a more just and equitable society. We're a relatively new center in the last six years and are affiliated with an older undergraduate minor program. Some of our programs include public facing design thinking workshops like you see here, um, as well as a social venture incubator, awards for student learning experiences, et cetera. The center is comprised of a mixed team of about 10 staff and faculty who, and we as faculty do our own research. And as a center, we programmatically facilitate change-making research opportunities and experiences, but we are not a research center per se, nor are we a center for community engagement. These are just some of our sort of touch points. So I'm gonna introduce you to PlayBuild. Um, as uh, Molly has said, uh, my name is Angela Kyle and I'm the co-founder and executive director uh, we have been partnered with uh, the Taylor Center for um, uh, formally for a few years, um, informally for almost six years. And uh, we're an all volunteer organization that is based in uh, the Central City neighborhood of New Orleans. And we're focused on transforming vacant lots into outdoor design classrooms. Our programming includes after school weekend programs and day camps for kids four to 12. And um, we um, have, uh, in, the, in the wake of the pandemic, um, shifted some of our programming virtual, um, as well as um, identified other ways to engage our um, community of kids and families. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and just um, share some context for, um, in 2005, uh, Katrina really did become the catalyst for a wave of social entrepreneurship uh, in New Orleans. Um, in response to Hurricane Katrina, uh, there was a tremendous amount of momentum and energy around um, rebuilding, um, particularly um, 
folks um, you know, coming in from outside New Orleans, but also anchor institutions in New Orleans, um, really focused on the effort. And um, with that, the Center for Public Service uh, formed at Tulane um, the year after Katrina. And um, examples like um, the Propeller Incubator, uh, which was uh, founded by a, a woman social entrepreneur, um, a pure startup, um, but really founded to kind of incubate and to accelerate um, some of the social impact and mission-driven organizations that were kind of popping up around the city. Um, our organization was kind of an interesting offspring of these two forces coming together. In 2012, um, Tulane's Architecture School, the City of New Orleans, and Propeller created a competition platform mm -hmm. inviting folks to submit ideas to um, tackle the blight challenge. And that competition was called Lots of Progress uh, with, the, with the pun fully intended. And um, I uh, submitted in response to that kind of call for ideas, I submitted the early stage concept for PlayBuild as um, a kind of architectural playground um, to engage kids uh, in, in, in learning and thinking about design. So as a result of that process, um, I subsequently connected uh, with Malia and um, some of the other stakeholders at uh, Tulane. And we really formed um, an informal partnership uh, around 2013 as we were just starting to prototype our concept. Um, that really evolved into uh, kind of working informally on a number of different collaborations for a few years. And then as Taylor itself um, came into formation, um, emerging from the social innovation, social entrepreneurship academic program, we became a formal partner of Taylor in uh, 2017. Our ongoing program with Taylor um, was um, something called the Fast 48, which is a 48 hour weekend um, immersion workshop in, uh, in design thinking and human centered design training. Yeah, so the FAST 48 primarily serves, it's a co-curricular program that primarily serves graduate students and professionals. It's public facing and open to anyone. Sometimes that could include PlayBuild stakeholders um, or, or volunteers as learning participants or representatives of the organization. But basically this, you know, multi-year semi-annual collaboration was really a model of a partnership based upon a rotating service learning-ish type of program and a design client model. So it wasn't formal service learning as a university would recognize it, but we were aiming for reciprocity and you know, we'd have this rotating cast of participants in the weekend who got to learn design thinking through practicing with a real partner and a real problem provided by PlayBuild. And the partner would instrumentally benefit from the student learning and ideas that would come out of it. So um, two summers ago, um, summer of 2019, uh, having probably gone through maybe 10 or so um, of these Fast 48 collaborations, um, we were starting to think about how to um, kind of shift our focus, um, shift our model a bit. Um, organizationally, some things had changed. I had a co-founder who'd stepped out. We had a team of AmeriCorps Vistas on the ground who um, had transitioned out. And um, one of the things we were really focused on was um, how to kind of shift power uh, in a fuller way to some of the community members that have been longtime collaborators. And um, these community members had been part of the Fast 48 and they presented the idea of um, really taking that concept and bringing it to the community um, and uh, actually uh, implementing a series of community-based design thinking trainings as a way to um, both build awareness of PlayBuild, but also to um, just start to engage the community more fully in this human-centered design practice. So in, um, in uh, the fall of 2019, uh, Malia did some scoping to figure out exactly how we could make this work and in response to, um, you know, to these community needs. And that led to um, us applying for a Community Engaged Research Award for, uh, from Tulane Center for Public Service. And our intent was to use that funding to train our community board members in a kind of train the trainer um, model 
in design thinking and other social innovation methodologies and um, to really um, you know, have a kind of connected um, research component as well. So uh, that, those were our grand plans. Um, we were awarded the funding in uh, February of 2020 and were really on the verge of um, making this all happen when um, COVID forced our, our shutdown. So I don't know if we need to say too much more here, but um, this is just a picture of the community board members that existed in the summer of 2019. And, um, you know, it sort of reflects this idea of moving to a, a different model. Um, this intended project, which never really happened, was a different model for how Playbuild would be operating as well as how Taylor entities would engage with Playbuild um, based around this idea of building capacity, right, in design thinking with the partner and co-creation. And another new aspect to this model would be to formalize the scholarly learning through community engaged research, really in an action research type of model. So as I said, this project didn't really happen. It kind of stalled out and we'll talk a little bit more about that through the spring and the summer. But just at that time, I wanted to explain that um, I was taking an action research co-lab. So with the Action Research Plus Network, shout out. Um, and I'm putting out there that I'm not an expert in these methodologies. This is the point in my career where I'm starting to try to really integrate them into my work. But I'm taking this collab and I'm also seeing calls for journals and conferences on community engagement innovations, much like this symposium here. And I was thinking, well, gosh, we're not doing anything with this project. It's not going anywhere and we've totally failed. And maybe that's an important story. So, May I decide let's regroup and maybe use some of the things I'm learning in the collab to write together about why this project is paused and what we're learning about ethical communi community engagement in the pandemic and beyond. And so this is where we get to model three, which is collaborative developmental action inquiry and our, our writing group only scratched the surface of this. Um, we were inspired by these approaches, but it started with myself and Angela and then grew to a team of eight stakeholders and included three faculty PIs on the original research project, another coworker, a graduate student, Angela, and two community board members from Playbuild. Our process involved writing and sharing individual journal entries of our unique takes on these past events and giving each other feedback. We wanted to reflect on the experience and what happened, but also kind of rework our mental models around partnership. So that was the developmental aspect where we were looking at our own perspectives and practices to grow as individuals and a group. So next we're gonna share some snippets of our writings and conversations and kind of highlight our different insights showing, and we're showing what's going on at the level of our partnership, our institutional partnership, but also what's happening for Playbuild and its own community relations. So in our inquiry process, we looked at the past and what happened to understand the gaps between our expected and actual outcomes. And in this way, we were engaging in single loop learning. So here we're really sharing um, three different perspectives, essentially uh, journal entries, um, our kind of pandemic points of view, really to juxtapose um, you know, our lived experience, which um, could not have been more different um, as we all kind of shifted gears and um, in some cases attempted to work and uh, maintain productivity. But in other cases um, with um, some of the, our peers and our community board, um, less fortunate in, in being able to do that um, because of the degree of disruption of the pandemic. Also, just really acknowledging that, you know, we galvanized this network, um, these very powerful, passionate, and committed women around a juggernaut of activity of essentially, um, you know, engaging deeply with community and with kids and families. And when that juggernaut of activity that they had, they had aligned around was suspended, we really lost the nucleus of that energy. Um, at the same time, we still had the obligation to funders and partners to uh, be doing something uh, to deliver on the mission. So in looking at um, the past, I think, you know, as Molly has said, we 
Um, we definitely uh, did not deliver on uh, necessarily on what we intended to do, kind of despite our best intentions. But we came to a lot of very important realizations about our partnership, about um, our collaboration, kind of working across difference, um, really, really living the experience of um, the pandemic, exacerbating the disparities across our own kind of microcosm of um, a working group um, as far as race and class. Uh, some of us were able to kind of turn and pivot on a dime and others were really not. And the question we ended up asking ourselves was, how do we bring people with us? How do we really engage across these different life worlds? So our inquiry also involved double loop learning, which was where we were really asking ourselves, are we doing the right things? Starting to question some of the assumptions underlying our patterns of behavior and rethinking some of our strategies and even our outcomes, right? So I show you this slide. It's um, a snapshot of my email inbox, the folder that's dedicated to this project. And this is the point of time where I'm sort of hitting pause. This is June and July. And as you can see, I'm exploring these different options um, for how to make this research and design thinking research and training project work. Um, I'm getting sort of hemmed in by institutional requirements around IRB and compensation. Um, I'm getting really frustrated, right? And um, I, some of my co-authors on the project didn't really understand why I was saying, I don't think we can move forward, but I was hearing about this organization and community that was like barely in survival mode. And I didn't think design thinking training was on any of their minds. So the little arrow up at the right is where my supervisor says, yes, pause seems good. I'm like, okay, great. So juxtaposed against um, Molly's institutional reality was the kind of uh, reality of what to do with the program. We had recently received funding to relaunch a series of pop-up events that um, we had um, launched originally in 2016, um, a, a program that was actually a, a partnership with Taylor. And so um, having to kind of re, really rethink and reinvent that, um, which we did through um, kind of taking the funding, redeploying it and creating what we call the, um, a, a, an imagination station network. So kind of taking the, the actual activities and toys and books and the things that are kind of our stock and trade and um, making them more accessible to kids and families through these installations uh, around the neighborhood. So this is one of the conversations among Tulane entities in the project that um, emerged after we were reading and writing about this project and we were sort of thinking about community engagement at a higher level. Because of time, we don't have time to sort of read through all of this, but I think they really point to, you know, our recognition of the white savior narrative that really came out of Tulane's post-Katrina shift and rebranding around community engagement. And the fact that, um, you know, we're hearing some university rhetoric about we're doing a great job responding to COVID because we know how to respond to disasters, but, um, you know, there's a sort of lack of recognition of the historically harmful context of that universities can have on a community. And so we're sort of saying, we don't want to see that story come out again, right? That the university has a lot to offer and we wanna be careful about sort of centering ourselves. And so in this double loop learning, we were really focusing, refocusing on changing needs and aspirations of community partners. So really coming, distilling back to why we're doing this work um, and recognizing that those needs um, and aspirations and conditions are changing all the time and that university institutional structures often are not set up well for the kind of dynamic shifting that's needed. And while there are other Tulane entities who might have been able to respond to help uh, Playbill shift this, their own work to you know, help run this design thinking training and research project, the Taylor Center, we just were not set up to do that. And then we're also sort of questioning at a high level the power dynamics of university responses to, to disasters and community needs. Again, we don't have time that much time to talk about triple loop learning, but we kind of got to the point where we were learning about our own learning and recognizing that we not only needed to call out um, disparities in terms of who has technology access and who doesn't, but who has access to knowledge in terms of who's been working on a project for a long time, who's new, how are we creating space for conversations for pe people to catch up? 
Leslie was our uh, new design thinking director coming in in the summer of 2019. And she's saying, we haven't had conversations like this before. And I'd like to see us hold space for people in the project to connect more. So, and this is a, just an example of us holding space with some of the community board members in a really lovely and wonderful conversation where we just explored, like, how do we want this partnership to look and feel for us and together? And the insights that came out of this were really about leaning into the pause as an opportunity for learning and, you know, sort of moving from this idea of having all of these different frames as stakeholders. There were many different versions of events from our co-writers that we didn't share here. Um, but moving from the idea that that could create resistance or problems to pulling out and seeing our frames as a source of strength. And we were only able to do that by like writing and reading and sharing and talking about them. And really that moving forward, we kind of turned to this idea of emergent strategy. If you're familiar with Adrian Marie Brown's work, there's also um, a, you know, work in the management literature around emergent strategy. But this idea that, you know, we're recognizing that roles and needs are real, are changing and, and we can't stop that. So let's stop fighting it and let's create space. Let's hold that space to build relationships, to let ideas emerge, to dream radical futures, um, and really to share power. And that's the intention at the heart of participatory action research, right? And so we're kind of basing our future engagement around this idea of we evolve through mutual transformation that requires learning and reflection on all of our parts. So yeah, that's, uh, that's our presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Malia and Angela. Um, so I, I actually have a question. And then, of course, if you have questions in the audience, please use the Q&A. Um, Malia, a word you used when you started was um, ethical and how this was an, um, a, perhaps an ethical practice. And I was wondering if you could speak more to how you've been thinking about this ethically, as well as um, for the future, for future forms of community engagement, how a pause may or may not show up in the work that you do to kind of pause and reflect. Yeah, I think the pause for us was ethical in terms of the very specific work that we were doing and we were planning. And on the one hand, I was sort of sad to say like something like design thinking training or creativity training or systems thinking, um, that capacity building should take the back seat in an organization like Playbuild and their network. The truth is that during this pandemic, it had to, right? And so it would have felt very unethical and I can't speak to whether that's objectively unethical, but it felt unethical to me at the time to say, we need to execute this project and we need to figure out a way to get these community board members on a Zoom call or dropping off, you know, hard copies of materials at their houses and going through with this training when, you know, they don't know their livelihoods are threatened. They don't know where they're, they're moving around. They're living in different places. They don't have access to technology or to why, you know, they might have a computer, but not a, a Wi-Fi connection or vice versa. So it felt really unethical to just try to take up so much space. And I felt that there was a little bit of institutional pressure to say like, oh, we have to keep doing these things and we have to keep providing this service. And at that moment, it felt like, um, you know, there are some interesting readings about like white supremacy culture in the workplace. And it felt like we were having like a sense of urgency about this that was unnecessary. What was urgent was that people were dying. What was urgent is that people were losing their jobs. What was urgent is that kids were out of school. This was not urgent. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, can you speak to how you navigated the obligations to funders um, who had provided funds towards a project that may no longer be relevant or, or perhaps useful given the changed circumstances? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, for the uh, neighborhood program, we had funding from um, the um, Nike Community Impact Fund, as well as a local foundation called For Kids. And um, thankfully, both were extremely flexible. Um, we have great communication, um, particularly with the local foundation. And um, we essentially just were able to tell them how we were um, stewarding the resources. Um, because what we had planned to do, we literally couldn't do because of the, um, 
because of the, the citywide shutdown orders. We couldn't gather people um, to do events. So um, that was, you know, we, we were fortunate in that case that um, funders were, were flexible and we were able to shift those resources and redeploy them. The small award from the university was from an internal entity. And so they were pretty relaxed about our saying, you know, this project isn't happening. And they were like, use the money how you want to. And I was like, okay, I'd like it to just give it away to community board members. So that's what we're doing. Thank you both. Thank you again, Malia and Angela. Um, last but not least, we are going to um, go to our uh, last two presenters from the University of San Diego, um, Rachel Castro and Maria Silva. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for everyone who presented before us. So much great learning. I appreciate it. And a lot of what our presentation will share has already been talked about. So. I think we can um, easily integrate all of the learning in, in this last one. So my name is Maria Silva. I'm Director of Community Partnerships at the University of San Diego. And I'm here with my colleague, Rachel Lozano Castro, who's the Director at the Brink Small Business Development Center at USD. And we are here to present about international community engagement, both pre and post pandemic and what's that, what that has looked like at USD. So um, our presentation is specifically about USD's Tijuana hub, which we'll be diving into and how this fits under our vision of being a binational anchor institution. Really delighted to be with you all today. Um, since the University of San Diego um, has as its vision to set a standard for an engaged and contemporary Catholic university, and we're part of the ethos of the university is to bring uh, student faculty, community members as innovative change makers to confront humanity's urgent challenges. It was a natural uh, response um, when the university went through a couple years of strategic initiative funding, allowing students, community partners, faculty, staff to present um, uh, ideas that we might be able to better live out our mission that we brought together different stakeholders um, along, around the campus to articulate what we were already doing in cross-border engagement. We have decades of experience from nursing to our uh, Office of Ministry and Mission um, across the border in our, our uh, sister city of Tijuana, Mexico. And so, um, and many, many uh, student uh, engagement projects and, um, and long-term community partnerships. So it was natural for us to present this uh, to that funding opportunity um, where we were able to get um, a year of funding for operations and maintenance after a year of um, real intentional mapping of what our um, existing work in Tijuana looked like. And we felt this was um, a really good way for us to live out our uh, mission as an anchor institution, for us to practice change making, and for us to um, make our um, the resources of the university more available um, to our community partners through access and inclusion. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so, Many of you may or may not be aware with the language of being an anchor institution. Uh, universities, hospitals, institutions that are rooted in their local communities can choose to have an anchor institution mission, which essentially means we are aligning both our economic and our social capital to impact the local region that we are rooted in. For us, as we started defining what our local region meant in order to better align these resources. Um, we made the choice to include the, the border region, to include Tijuana in what we define as our local community. So as you'll see in the map here, the University of San Diego is about 20 miles north of the US-Mexico international border. And as we have continued to scope out and, um, and create initiatives that channel both social and financial capital into our local region, we consider the Tijuana region as, as one of those um, neighborhoods or, uh, or cities or areas where we're very strategically investing um, resources in. So as Rachel was saying, the first part of this funding that we received to build a Tijuana hub was meant to map out 
the existing collaborations that we have in Tijuana. So Rachel will share a link to a story map that we are in the process of developing right now. I think it has about 10 different projects that we're actively involved in, in the city of Tijuana. Tijuana is the largest growing urban area in all of Mexico. So it is a vast region with a variety of um, immigrant communities. It's a very diverse, very culturally rich region. And we are lucky that we have a history of being involved and engaged uh, in the region. You'll see in that story map, just a sample of the different projects and entities that are involved in cross-border work. But at USD that includes, as Rachel mentioned, everyone from the School of Nursing to our lawyers at the legal clinics, um, students in, in, in the School of Engineering, students in the School of Architecture, uh, work around immigrant uh, communities, work on a number of different social justice areas. So. The first part of this project was really meant to understand what we were currently involved in so that we could then uh, grow from that. In 2019, 2020, which is the latest year we have raw or data for, we were involved in 21 dif different community engagement activities in Tijuana with 22 different community partners. Over 18 faculty members were involved. Over 420 students were participating in the work across the border and every single USD school was involved in some way, shape or form uh, in cross-border engagement. So this is part of the mapping work that happened as, as part of the grant that we received for the Tijuana Hub. So what does this engagement actually look like? I wanna highlight one project that actually started pre-pandemic and ended post-pandemic, and it's called Digital Narratives. This is a partnership with an organization called Alma Migrante in Tijuana. Alma Migrante is an amazing nonprofit doing work to uplift human rights defenders uh, in Tijuana and also doing policy work to shape um, more humane immigration policy in Tijuana. So a couple of years ago, they invited us to be part of this digital narratives project that records the personal narrative of human rights defenders and creates a platform for these narratives to be shared. So um, human rights defenders themselves are the authors of their narrative. And our the role of USD of our students is helping with the video production of these stories. So when this project started, we went down to Tijuana. You'll see in this picture, um, a couple of our students are meeting with Hector, one of the human rights defenders that's highlighted in the project. So the initial meeting happened in person. It happened in Tijuana. We were recording the narratives of these human rights defenders along with them and, and in the setting that they do the work in. Um, the hope is that these narratives will increase the visibility of, of human rights defenders and their work and also help raise awareness about different social justice er issues in, in the border region. Right in the middle of this program, the pan of this project, the pandemic hit. And so this is one of the projects that we were able to easily transition into a virtual community engagement experience because at the time the pandemic hit, the narratives had already been recorded. So the rest of the work was just tweaking the video production, piecing together the, the audio and the different pictures that the, narrative, that the defenders wanted to be featured in their narrative. And so all of that students were able to do remotely and, uh, and the project was, uh, was completed by the end of the semester. We're now in our second round of participating in this project and all of it is taking place via Zoom. So we were able to continue our partnership and, uh, and continue to bring light to the stories of these human rights defenders, even amidst the pandemic. Rachel will share in the chat box one of the finished narratives so that you can take a look at what uh, the final product of this project is. And here's a reflection from one of the students that participated in this project. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I did wanna highlight um, her thinking around each story taught and brought a sense of connection to my roots of actis activism. This is a student that is Mexican American herself, but ha lives in the East Coast and had never really been connected to 
cross-border stories or to the work of human rights defenders on the border. And so her ability to recognize her own self and her roots in the stories of the defenders she was working with um, really shined light on, on her own identity, which uh, was really cool to see. And I'll turn it over to Rachel. Super, so I um, would love to just sort of share the diversity of projects um, and trying to bring together different disciplines through this work um, of the Tijuana Hub because really the Tijuana Hub is just kind of convening mapping and um, trying to coordinate better the existing efforts um, so that they so that the work of the university is really engaged with the shifting and deep needs of the and the communities that we work with and the educational partners we have across the university, particularly our higher ed partners. And so um, when we first conceptualized this, um, it was uh, facilitated and driven a lot by our social innovation work and our community engagement work. And um, as a school of business, which is where I'm located, I, I direct a small business development center where we have about a thousand small businesses. And so we've um, certainly been uh, thinking about all of the needs that they have um, during a pandemic and helping with a lot of the the COVID relief, but also looking to what are the some of the opportunities. And there's already been some, um, you know, moves to bring back some business from, um, for example, from parts of Asia back to our border region. It's already been a trend that's been undergoing, but hasn't necessarily been something that has been driven by the workforce needs of Tijuana and uh, some of the, the ways that small businesses could um, take advantage of the opportunity in, in, in Tijuana. So what we did is we engaged, um, about a semester ago, we engaged a market research uh, class and they were able to, um, at University of San Diego, they were able to uh, work through this research question that I have up here about what are some of the reasons why um, we don't have more binational business um, uh, at the small business level. They use some robust data collection methods and made some recommendations. And the really cool thing about this is that this project was done in uh, partnership with some uh, faculty from CETIS Universidad in Tijuana, which is a, a really premier school and they're particularly their business school, then was able to, with their students, uh, do the research um, in reverse. So what are some ways that uh, small businesses in Baja California and Tijuana might be able to um, engage more with resources um, from the entrepreneurial ecosystem in San Diego. So it was really fun to do that in a sort of a reciprocal way um, where um, the students were able to engage with faculty and students from, from both sides. And um, we've been able to do that with some other classes too, but really liked that example. Um, and then the next one we have is, um, uh, this is a, a class that uh, is, is going on right now that I'm teaching in, in Tijuana virtually and what it's been a great opportunity for us to um, be able to bring in faculty. You can see uh, on the bottom uh, Zoom screen faculty from the University of San Diego to uh, work with the students um, in Tijuana over Zoom and then social entrepreneurs from both sides of the border. And of course, because of the opportunity of um, uh, being virtual, we're also bringing some social entrepreneurs into this entrepreneurship class um, from uh, Ecuador and the Philippines and a couple other contexts. So been a, a good opportunity for us to, again, open up the, the resources of the university um, in, in more engaged ways, um, as well as um, kind of offer uh, additional cross-cultural um, engagement opportunities for the students. And some of the lessons learned as we transitioned this work onto virtual. And our colleagues at Tulane, Tulane named a lot of these, but it became crucial. It always has been. It is the nature of community engagement work to have flexible expectations, but it became crucial to do this under a pandemic, right? We had to be even more aware of the changing circumstances and needs, not just of our community partners, but also of our students, right? What are we asking from our community partners? I really appreciated our, our colleagues in Tulane kind of pausing and, uh, and reflecting on what projects still made sense as we were trying to survive and still are trying to survive at pandemic and which of them um, need to be sunset really and, and no longer have the same weight or, or value as they did maybe when we envisioned them. We also learned we had to find creative ways to communicate and stay in touch with our partners, especially in Tijuana. 
And we quickly learned that a lot of them had issues with technology and, uh, and being connected to Wi-Fi and that emailing wasn't gonna be the best way to stay in touch with our partners. We're very much used to being present at the sites that we work with. I'm usually in Tijuana at least once a week. Rachel lives in Tijuana. And so doing this work and, and being in the spaces where the work happens is really important in trust building and relationship with our and relationship building with our partners and that no longer was feasible. So being creative in terms of does Zoom really make sense for our partners or is it better to FaceTime or to just call or is WhatsApp the, the best way to communicate with partners in Tijuana were some of the questions we were asking ourselves and also uh, training our students around. Again, seeking meaningful community engagement opportunities, not just creating work for work's sake. We didn't want to you know, maintain some of the projects if they no longer made sense just to keep ourselves busy, right? We wanted to do it if, if it was really reciprocal and meaningful for, for both ends. And so we prioritized nurturing our partnerships and continuing to build trust and being okay with letting go of, of certain projects um, or taking on completely different projects if it made more sense. And as always in this work, just being adaptive, adapt, adapt, adapt to all the changing circumstances. We're gonna to transition to talk a little bit about what the hub itself is and what we envisioned for it. Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Even um, pre-pandemic when we're envisioning the hub, we envisioned it as a multi-purpose space that could be used uh, to facilitate co-designs, um, design thinking workshops that's been, that have been discussed a little bit earlier today, which is what we've been doing uh, for the last couple of years in, in Tijuana with our university partners. And that this Tijuana hub could be a jump off space um, for um, University of San Diego to engage in um, places where we are already working. It doesn't mean that everybody has to come use this space, but that it would be a really useful place and provide resources for the immediate community members as well as our engaged partners um, and be really an asset um, for them. And so it would be, again, multi-use. It would probably be um, you know, small at the beginning and iteratively built um, so that it could serve facilitation, teaching, debrief, uh, storage needs and uh, would be a place that we could advance engaged scholarship and increase the number of partnerships that we have um, with uh, partners, as well as a very, um, a fairly engaged uh, alumni base that we have in Tijuana and Baja California. And so that there is a lot of, a lot of interest in doing um, social events, et, et cetera. So again, that was pre-pandemic and that, that was sort of the, some of the ways that we imagined a space that could be used for art and scholarship and Spanish classes, et cetera. And then um, we have realized that there's lots of opportunity now for, for sure for us to continue to um, uh, respond to the digital divide as well as offer more um, kind of immediate community needs in the space. So we have, like many that have shared today, put a pause on some of the, the location of the, the space and been able to um, define the word hub a little bit more broadly than just the space, um, but our engaged work across um, across our, our different partners in Tijuana. And we just shared on that next, if you don't mind, uh, Maria, on the next one, just had some photos of the stakeholder feedback and communication. The main thing I wanted to share here is that we've realized, uh, or we've, I don't know that we've learned, but we've been really asking ourselves, um, when do we solicit feedback? Back to Maria's point about not creating work for work, but soliciting feedback at the right points, communicating about the project in an ongoing way so people know that they their thoughts have been heard and that we're still listening um, and we're still, we're still building, but also making sure that the communication is relevant to where people are at and not asking people to just jump onto Zoom for the sake of jumping on Zoom. So we've been really trying to be judicious with how we've uh, requested time, particularly of our educational partners in Tijuana and some of the community partners. And then um, the next one that I put is just an example from, um, from our mural that we used. And I think that the, the main lesson we had there is there was a really cool insights that came out of this. Um, we had engagement from pretty much every um, academic unit on campus um, with this exercise, but definitely before we did the same thing with uh, our, our community partners, we realized there is a beauty and simplicity. And so we, we kind of made the technology a little bit more accessible 
and uh, planned it in a different way so that, because um, one of the things that we learned through this process is, of course, when you're doing things online, there is sometimes a, a pressure to push the pace quicker um, and not give people the reflective time that you might have in person. Um, and so we, we tried to build in that reflection time uh, more intentionally for the, for the later um, set of di digital encounters. And so now, as uh, Rachel was, was sharing short term and taking into consideration the current context we're in and, and the limitations of obviously university endorsed international travel is, is, not, um, is not available currently. And so what can we feasibly do short term uh, under this Tijuana hub umbrella? And what we, along with our partners, have identified as the main needs is access to Wi-Fi and technology. So we're working with a few different stakeholders in Tijuana to, on a pilot project to create access to Wi-Fi at one of the, um, at our community partner sites. And um, in, in have that be a resource through which we can continue and increase our virtual engagement. One other thing that has been brought up by our partners as a huge need in the short term is for the university to act as a communications hub so that partners themselves are aware of the work that uh, that different partners are doing in Tijuana. Sometimes they are not connected to each other, but when the university convenes the different partners, they're able to see and learn what other organizations are doing in Tijuana at that, and that becomes helpful for them. It, it creates access to different resources. So another thing short term that we've been asked to do is to act as this communications hub that can share information within our network of partners. Longer term, we're still, we were able to ask for an extension on the grant for the Tijuana hub and the university granted us this extension. And so it is still our vision to have an actual physical space in Tijuana, the, the Tijuana hub. And we've gathered a ton of feedback from both Tijuana and on-campus stakeholders around the best location for this co-located space, as well as the amenities it should include. Uh, the function, um, how it should be organized and used and, um, and accessibility for this Tijuana hub. So long-term, once the university is able to, to travel internationally again, um, we, we do expect to have a physical location in Tijuana. Short-term, we're working on these other strategies. And that's all we have there our information is on there we would love to hear from you I don't know if there's time for questions now but you can feel free to contact either Rachel or myself with any comments or questions and thanks again for the team for organizing this and for having us. Thank you for having us and I just wanted to mention I, I chatted a link to um, the website we have for this project if you were interested also in the process because I think that's one of the, been one of the greatest things about today is um, the insight into what some of these processes could be replicated and learn from. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I, last time, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Um, to start, I was wondering, um, when you think about the actual physical space of the hub, what are some of the amenities that have been kind of pitched um, to include there? I think it was a double-edged sword to ask that question of the different stakeholders because yeah. everyone wants different amenities, right? Um, there were some community partners were saying we should have a vegetable garden and others were saying we need, you know, closed space for one on one meetings with asylum seekers. The School of Nursing really wanted storage space for supplies that they're constantly taking up, up taking across the border. And so how you create a multi purpose space that fits the needs of the broad range of stakeholders is a, a an important challenge that we'll face whenever we're actually scouting for the space. But our hope is that we're able to meet at least a basic level of, of necessities across the board and that this space is really adaptive and flexible. Rachel, I don't know if you'll, you would add anything. Yeah, and I just I would just add, I think the minimum lovable version of that to use sort of like the iterative approach from business is that it would include some level of locker back off, backpack drop off so people could have it be sort of like the first encounter at the border when they go do other things and the rest of the city, we have all sorts of, um, you know, community partners that host us. So there would be solutions to some of these other needs um, through some of our partnerships, it, the space wouldn't be able to answer every need for every stakeholder. Thank you. 
That's quite for any questions. And I can open it up to for any questions for the rest of our panelists as well. There's one more. If not, um, I want to thank all of our presenters again. Um, as we know, community engagement work and efforts are very complicated and multifaceted, and the pandemic has only amplified that. Um, I was asked to kind of think about, as I listened to, across the panelists, um, a couple of takeaways that I think our audience members might might um, take with them. And so the first, and um, I love um, Maria and Rachel's slide talking about adapt, adapt, adapt. And across all of the presenters, I saw the spirit of adaptability during this time. Um, the engagement station in Portland, using Zoom and all of these different ways to enhance communication and share stories and narratives, um, really turning, um, to use Ashley's phrase, obstacles into opportunities. And so um, as we're moving forward, even once we've gotten past this um, pandemic moment, that that spirit of adaptability maintains. Um, but also, with that, taking the time to reflect and in some ways reorient um, our, our positions on the work that we're doing. Um, that pause and, and thinking about how um, our, our positions with relation to our communities, particularly when the need just kind of increase in these in these multifaceted unexpected ways is, is super important. And so um, I hope with those two takeaways that um, everyone in the audience continues to do this amazing work. Thank you so again to our panelists for their insights and their um, important, important, um, difficult, but necessary work. Um, though you cannot see it, I'm sure our attendants are cheering with me from wherever they are. And to the audience, thank you so much for coming and engaging. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Tal. Thank Great you. Great job, everybody. Really good. It's terrific. Great presentations. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. We'll that. keep track of the questions, I think, that came in so we can pass them along and people can respond if they want to. I'd love for there to be longer feedback on that stuff, right? Because they were, these were terrific. Great thoughtful questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. So much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Have a good evening at four, you. wherever you are. All right, guys, I'm off to a board meeting. I'll have another Zoom, <laughs> Zoom board meeting. I'll talk to you later. Thanks, Namesh and Katie. Thank you so much, Barbara. That was great. Thanks, Barbara. Have a good Thank night. You too. Bye. We'll be brief later. Talk soon. Bye bye. Bye, Katie. Bye. <laughs>